we've done. So um, I, I just thought that we would do another Paleolithic stab today. Um, and what has been mentioned is that we've mentioned um, we mentioned Romania a little bit. Um, so there's a bit of sex in tonight. We, we talk about sex between a Neanderthal and a Homo sapien. So uh, that'll be right up Drina Street. Uh, we, we look at Gibraltar. I know we mentioned the Germany site last week, so we won't, won't be doing that one. And we'll be doing one British site, and that will be it tonight. And we might mention a certain female archaeologist called Sylvia um, Benton. Right. So to make things easy for me, I, I need to know, um, right, if, right, uh, right, Andy, whose computer are you using? My old um, my iMac one. So I'm trying to trying to join in now, but it's it's running a bit slow. So if you get a strange person asking, it's that's who it is. It right, might... and we got Jess. We got Jess on the phone now as well. Hang on a minute. Hiya, Jess. Apologies, Carlo. I'm logging in now. I just wanted to let you know so you can let me in before starting. Well, you know, we weren't going to let you in. But now we will let you in. All right, Don. Well, well hurry up. We'll just we'll, we'll go around the houses and we'll we'll, we'll let you in in a minute. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Right, Andy. Any news from you this week, darling? No, no. I've been a good boy today. I've been decorating. No, you've been a bad boy because you're with Drina. Right. Okay, um, Drina. Any news from you, darling? No. No. Sorry. Well, you don't have to apologise for indiscrepancies. Um. Right, what about um, Anne, um, Sabita? No, no, no news. Okay. Right, okay. Um, Pete, what about news from you? Well, only about a, a calendar over in uh, uh, Peru where they have, they've got 11 illocs all in a line on a hill. And uh, it was recognised as a calendar because on each month the, uh, the rising sun uh, appears between two of those uh, hills. But well, two, well, they are hillocks or towers or whatever you like to call them. But once a month, the uh, the sunrise appears between us, uh, the next set of uh, of uh, towers, and that gives them the idea of the uh, the calendar and what part of the year we're in. Yeah. So, so where was this again? It's um, talk Chan Kili. Chanquilly in Peru. That sounds like Chanquilly lace, doesn't it? Right, okay, brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, did you say there was nine mountains? There's a whole row of ta these towers, and as I, like I said, as the sun rises, it shines between the uh, between the two two uh, uh, towers, and the next month, it's, it's, it moves one along. How it moves from the when it gets to the end back to the other end, I don't know. Picture, you said there was nine towers. No, thirteen. Mark, that makes sense. Yeah, I can go with yeah, 13. 13 for the, the months of the year, yeah. Yeah. No, 12, yes. but 13. No, 13 lunar months. Ah, uh, right, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was I, I was reading something else then. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for that, Pete. That's okay. Um, right, who else have we got? We, we haven't got Claire with us, but we've got Pat with Pat there. So, Pat, any news from you? No, right not. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> was it because you were singing along with a pirate in Newquay? <laughs> Talking to my daughter, American daughter. <laughs> I, I tell you what, she's 12 times uh, taller than you. <laughs> six one, uh, six foot. Good. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, she was a bit of a corker, really. <laughs> good, good. I yeah, but, but, but I, I know she's trouble, so I'll leave her alone. Um, uh, um, Margaret and Andy and Drina. Hang on a minute. What the hell's going on here? Who the hell are Andy and Drina? Drina's yeah, not in the spell. Did, Mike. What? I did have a did have a picture for a minute, um, but we got no sound on it because it's not updated. But um, we can hear you on the other one, so we're getting there. Uh, we use. I, 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 I don't leave it right, uh, Margaret. Any news, uh, Margaret? You've always got something to say because you've got a gob on you like a fog on. So come I on. I know. I know. I can't help it. I'm just very keen. That's what it is. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, uh, I've been I've been delving into the onside archive in my garage. Oh. And, um, 
uh, these little books, they're called Antiquity. Antiquity. And yeah. we've got loads and loads and loads of them. Uh, and there's lots of interesting information in there, but it's from 1982. <laughs> so I right. think, oh, I've gone. No, you haven't. We, we can hear you. Keep you talking. Yes. Well, I can't see me. Well, well, okay. look, I know you're vain, right? But we can hear you. Carry on. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Well, there's a lady called Myra Shackley who was um, a lecturer at your university, at the University of Leicester. Leicester. Right, yeah, I got, oh, wow, cool. And back in 1982, she has written The Case for Neanderthal Survival, Fact Fiction or Faction. Nice. And she mentions about, um, and this is in, not Mongolia, what's the other place, beginning with S? Uh, uh, Siberia. Uh, no, not Siberia, um, Serbia. Siberia. In oh, Siberia. Um, yeah. A group of wild people called the Almasti. Have you heard of them? Mm, probably somewhere, but not, not recently. Yeah, go on. And they're quite well known by the local tribes people, are quite aware yep. of them. And uh, they bear a striking resemblance to what we know about the Neanderthal people. <laughs> and um, so she, she has put, a, there's a whole section in this book about it. Yeah. Uh, she thinks that they were alive and well in 1982 and living in Siberia. And, and it, that, that, that's rather interesting, but it, it, it does actually it does actually tie in with what we've been saying, that, the, that uh, it's all this massive interbreeding. Um, and obviously, one thing that I'm really starting to get convinced with is that there's no pure bred people coming out of Africa. They've already ready interbred before they've got into Europe. Mm. And that's exactly something that we will be looking at today. Jolly good. No, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's working quite well. Um, right, it's a shame Dave is not with us today. And um, we, we, we've got a bit of uh, got a bit of sex and intrigue, which would have been right up Claire Street. So it's a shame she's not with us tonight. So um, anyway, so I did have a look. We're, we're going to look, look at the images in a different way tonight, um, i.e. I'm going to um, chuck on Google um, and we're just going to do it that way because I, I, I started downloading everything and uh, I had it all there and the next minute it's gone. So I'm still trying to work out this phone. So I, I want to introduce today, I did mention that we'll be looking at Gibraltar. And I will be looking at Romania as well. And the, the way we will do this is to try and uh, try and compare lots of the things that we've already been thinking about and looking at and examining. Um, and then, as I said earlier on, we could go on and do the Paleolithic period for another month. But I, I do want to crack on. Um, with the Mesolithic period, because there's just so much to look at. And we will probably get to Otzi the Iceman by probably the end of the year. Um, anyway, so if I go to there, and I've got these nice little images here, and this is the way we're going to do this. So the images are showing you? Yeah. 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 Right, what I've got to do, I've got to, I've got to put Baldrick in his house, right, because he's calling me. So I will be, I will be 30 seconds. Give him a kiss from me, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very demanding bird, isn't he? Big for a kiss. <laughs> he did like a king. <laughs> Cage and onion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got cakes there, Drina? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's not fair. But actually, can you see Baldrick now? No, no. Oh, oh, all right then. We'll get we'll, we'll get Baldrick on. Hang on a minute. He, 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 Baldrick deserves a bit of uh, limelight. Okay. Uh, okay. Are we seeing Baldrick? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Baldrick! <laughs> Come a little closer. <laughs> no, I want to see him closer. That's it. Oh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> and you. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll put like his house the... now. And they're basically that's his little wattles there, and that's his snood. I'll put it. I'll put him to bed now. Come on, lovely. Can you? Anything? Can you? Probably terrified, poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. It's raining, man. Hallelujah, it's raining, man. I'll get one for Trina. La, 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 la. Right, anyway, carry on. Sorry about that, folks. Um, you know, you can't have these lectures with me without seeing a bit of um, turkey. Of life. I, I, I was going to be really crude then, but I decided not to be. Right, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't think of that funny. <laughs> um, anyway, we're going to be looking at this cave here, a Gibraltar cave, right? I, I can't. Oh, do we do we want it in landscape? Okay, we'll do it in landscape then. Is that all right? <sighs> okay. Oh, hang on, mate. We did, we we had it then. Oh my. Oh, what's that now? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I faff about with this, and it all goes to pop. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Does that, oh, that's does a that lovely look... photo of Michelle. I, I thought we were looking at a cave. And we are now, but I saw Michelle. Yeah. Yeah, well, photo. Know, that, 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 that goes without saying. What is this? A comedy routine tonight? Let's get on with it. Right, anyway. Um, so I wanted to mention I wanted to look at Gibraltar and I wanted to look at the Gibraltar girl. Now I I've got some really nice facts in front of me which which we're gonna which we're gonna look at. And I needed to do this Gibraltar girl. Uh, because it's known and it, it's it's is a nice story about it. And the Gibraltar girl is was the first piece of evidence that we had to see that there was <laughs> some kind of coupling between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And then people started to think, oh, you know, the, the first thing the first thing is is that when when Gibraltar girl and we'll, we'll just we'll just see her now. Uh, the, these are all images of Gibraltar girl. Um, now, uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to go with uh, that one there. Yeah. So uh, Gibraltar girl. Now, the the first thing to be said is that Gibraltar girl was mm. dismissed as being able to procreate and create other hominids. In other words, what they say is Gibraltar girl was an accident, a coupling of a homo sapien and a homo sapien Neanderthal. And they say that um, she wasn't able to proc procreate and uh, produce children. And that was it. That was the end of the line. But now, because people didn't want to believe that our hominids crossbred, they really didn't want to believe it. But now the evidence, the, the amount of volume of evidence to tell us that, you know, hum humans of whatever type, whatever hominids, uh, were meeting and matching and creating. Um, and then that story that Margaret mentioned earlier on about, um, I know what she's talking about, a group of people in Siberia um, having great Neanderthal characteristics. But then again, it, it's it's not only possible, it is, it is, and that's what we've got. So, there, there are lots of people, there are still a lot of people out there who will just say that, you know, um, I'm talking absolute nonsense and the Neanderthals died out. Um, but we're really not going to go with that anymore. We're, we're just going to really try and get to grips. So um, I've got I've got this thing, Neanderthals in Gibraltar. and there's, It's a much bigger story. It's a much bigger story than just this, the image of this um, girl here today. We we did see lots of other images, um, and that's her skull. Now there there is her skull, um, and there's been lots of other images, um, reconstructions of what she may have looked like, and they're all really really different. Um, you know that's very very different than the other reconstructions. So. I think we'll just stick with this one, but what we what I want to do is go back to the image of Gibraltar Cave. Now, 
we all know where Gibraltar is, so we don't need to cite that. We don't really need to sort of, you know, it, but what we do, what we do want to do um, is, is there's lots of these wonderful images and on the base, on the cave floor of, of this cave, which is Gorham's cave in, in Gibraltar, there's several caves in Gibraltar. We're not going to do all of them. I just want to do a bit of overview. This, this is actually cave art on, on the floor of the cave. And guess who produced this cave art? Neanderthals. Or well, we do believe it was Neanderthals or, or crossbreed Neanderthals. And what, what they're basically, what they're saying is obviously you've got this, this line here um, and you've got this tall cliff 55 metres in height. Um, and in, inside that cave is this wonderful depth of archaeological evidence. Um, again, looking out at the cave from the depths, this is actually an uh, image on Wikipedia, so you're looking out. But this is, would not have been a view that our ancestors would have experienced. So this is Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar. Um, it's a sea level cave, as we've already uh, demonstrated. Uh, but it's not a sea cave as, set, as such. It's a sea level cave. A sea cave is when water washes into the cave and washes everything away. It's not on that level. Um, so this itself is considered to be one. Now, this is something you'll hear a lot um, if you don't go outside the box like I do. Considered to be one of the last known habitations of the Neanderthals in Europe. But we now know that that's not true because Neanderthals never died out. What we also find in Gibraltar itself is um, there are a number of other caves and Gibraltar with its Paleolithic caves would not be complete if it didn't have a cave known as Hyena's, Hyena Cave. And in Hyena Cave, uh, we've got evidence going back 55,000 years. So we, we look at Neanderthal, the Neanderthals now in, in the new light of the lectures that we've been doing. And you know, Margaret just chucked it in there into the loose grass. And, you know, it, it, it's just the evidence is undeniable now. We, we can't we can't not say that the Neanderthals didn't survive because they're in us. They are here. Um, and I, what I wanted to do today, I wanted to look at the Romanian site as, as like, um, you know, prim and proper, as I've been doing over the past few weeks. But I, th I found this wonderful article and I thought, no, um, we're just going to say it as it is the attraction of an, um, a Neanderthal and a Homo sapien and what happened, right? Um, and you know what happened, they had sex, they, 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 they procreated, but I wanted just to do the, the story what that is and, and try to get some depth to that story. So anyway, back to Gibraltar, um, what, what we do see, I haven't given you any dates yet. Was Gibraltar inhabited 60,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. But the evidence tells us that what we do find in Gorham's cave is that Gorham's cave offers us evidence from at least 55,000 years ago. Um, the cave was named after a chap by the name of Gorham, um, who discovered the cave. Um, he discovered the cave. Um, you know, it, 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 it'd been somehow um, a fissure in the rock and suddenly it started to open and... What we, what we do find with Gorham's cave, he went in there with a, with a lamp and, and he explored. Um, Gorham's cave itself is a cave which is rather unusual. Now, we're not going to go into geology. Uh, it's a cave that's, that's um, a Triassic rock cave, right? It's not the Carboniferous rock cave. It's a, it's a Triassic rock cave. Carboniferous rock is very hardy. Um, and that's where we get the, the bank of archaeological evidence for in regards to our Paleolithic in this country. Um, and obviously the Devonian rocks, um, caves, limestone caves down um, in, in Tor, Tor Bay. But this is a Jurassic uh, limestone rock cave. And it's an interesting length. It's a hundred meter long um, cave there. Um, and interesting enough, what we're going to what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of information. And then, then I want to do. Um, then I want to sort of examine this girl and, and try to understand her a little bit more and who she is and give her a little bit more background. So there's been extensive work in regards to this cave, and they've found stone tools and 
lots of pottery and obviously the pottery is going to be a, a lot more recent. Lots of the artifacts have been have ended up in the British Museum Naturally, Gibraltar's part of our wonderful land. Um, and it was uh, Gorham's, Gorham's cave itself um, being um, discovered in 1907. However, uh, what we do know is that people have been working in regards to Gibraltar for quite some time, finding wonderful evidence of um, pseudo Neanderthals since well before Neanderthals were recognized in Germany, which is another interesting thing. Uh, when we think about the, the Neanderthals are named after the Neander Valley in Germany um, in the late 1850s, Neanderthal skulls are being found. But archaeological work is uh, being undertaken in Gibraltar, not at this cave, but in Gibraltar. And we were finding evidence of Neanderthal stroke Homo sapiens sapiens um, before they were being found in Germany. So that's an interesting point, but we didn't give them a name. They uh, um, Just think, Neanderthals would be called um, um, Gibraltarthals um, if only we had realised that they had been first discovered in Gibraltar. Now, we, we, we do see that the, the cave itself was excavated properly or supposedly um, excavated in 1948. Um, and the strange thing with the excavations in 1948, when I sort of shuddered to say it was a proper archaeological excavation, um, the excavations that were undertaken lost all the artefacts. And the um, Gibraltar Museum was a bit heaved off with this. So uh, what, what we do see is in regards to not this cave, but Gibraltar itself, is that there was a skull found by Dorothy Garrod, uh, the, the famous Dorothy Garrod in the 1920s, uh, in regards to um, in regards to um, Gibraltar um, and this 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 skull itself. Um, is a wonderful, interesting, fascinating artifact, and just just a few things. This is just to get a taste of of the caves. Within this cave itself, we we know that we've got artifacts um, that are at least fifty five thousand years old, and at least artifacts that are associated with Neanderthals. But the strange thing is with this cave is that. No fossil remains of any hominid has been found in the caves, just the tools. But what we've got is a rather interesting story. Now, I just I'm probably rushing through this because there's a lot to do. Um, but what I would like to do is show you this. Now, this is rather interesting. Um, I said this was Neanderthal. Now, it might be. Might not be. Who cares? And this is this is the point. I don't really care about our hominid subtypes or Neanderthal or Denisovian or Homo sapiens sapiens or Homo sapiens or Pygobogensis or anything. What I can see is that they've all made a contribution to evolve into us. This, this, these number of them. Um, were found scratched into the floor at Gorham's cave, deeply scratched into the floor. Um, how do what, what do we know about what do we know about these? Researchers and researchers uncovered a series of crisscrossing lines over um, an area of eleven square feet. So just a just sort of an, an area on the ground, but there was a number of them, um, and these were actually cut into what seemingly was was the floor level was a little bit of a raised um, area. Um, and this was found not at the front of the cave. And obviously the front of the cave would, would obviously, you've got erosion and stuff. But these were actually found at the back of the cave, way at the back, 100 metres towards the back of the cave. And the scratches consist of eight 
eight lines arranged in two groups of three long lines and intersected by two shorter ones. And the, the scratches overall date to at least 39,000 years ago because, well, the scratches in, in rock, how do we date them? That's the question. So they date from 39,000 years ago. And they were found below a layer of undisturbed settlement. Um, and obviously, the undisturbed settlement is a terminus antiquem date. So you date that layer. And then that's going to be older than the layer below. So these are at least 39,000 years old and older. And in that layer above this, they found one, two, hundreds of Neanderthal tools. So do we attribute these to Neanderthals? Do we just attribute them to to our human ancestors and that's what i'm going to say from now on um i i'm gonna i'm gonna be a bit more revolutionary i'm just gonna call them our human ancestors because there's another reason for that and i may as well spit it out and it's been a bit of a laughing joke for the past five six seven whatever years we, we we've had like over since I've met Andy, we, we've we've had oh the Neanderthals were the first to paint paint shells and the first to paint caves and they were the first to have musical instruments and they were fir the first to use certain tools to eat, um, hunt certain animals and they were the first um, they were the first ones to make certain types of buildings and they were the first ones to uh, drill holes into shells and they were the first ones to do this and they, mind you they were the first to do everything right. And you start to think, well, okay, you just get over it, right? Let, let's just think of these as our ancestors, and that's it. Let's just go over it. So um, there's a point. But you you want me to you want me to say that these are Neanderthal carvings, and I I would love to say they're Neanderthal carvings, but who cares who carved them? They're 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 over thirty nine thousand years old. Um. And they, they were made by by people, people that wanted to give a message, wanted to tell us something, wanted us to understand what they understood. They understood the world as these scratches and whatever these scratches meant to them were, were really important. And what I've been what I said to my gang last night down here i said let's just try and see the past as not a challenging thing of dates or who did this and who did that they did it and let's see these as part of the transitional archaeological evidence and the authorship of these being key to our understanding of their world and our world. Uh, they can be described as being abstract. They demonstrate, firstly, the abstract idea consistently created in the rock and concentrated and deep concentrations etched into the rock. They're really deep carvings into this limestone rock. Yes, Pete, it's not as hard as that volcanic rock from Cornwall, but nevertheless, carving a gouge into limestone, which is several millimeters deep, is a little bit of an achievement. It, you know, if I had a bit of a limestone rock now and I just I just started gouging into it with, a, with an iron knife um it would take me more than a few minutes to do it is this creativity is this a cognitive step in human development or is this more of them telling us something that we <clears throat> don't understand 
I made that point last week, didn't I? About them being more in, more intelligent than us. Did I say in some ways or did I say in, in all ways? I didn't specify. I remember that. But the behavior of their world is something that we do understand. And is it a distinguishing mark between two sets of hominids? Or is it just a distinguishing mark of people that wish to be within that cave? Or have we overestimated the importance or underdone the importance of these carvings in the rock? I'm sure we've all got a piece of marble in our house that we cut into meat with an iron knife. And we make a little mark into that marble. Marble is softer than limestone. In fact, marble is a type of limestone. Somebody did say, however, that these marks may have actually been accidental. <laughs> Not really. You know, accidentally, can't, accidentally doing this in the same place. But let's hear this, this out. For example, as a byproduct of using the rock as a surface for cutting meat or fur, they carried out experiments with tools. This is the archaeologist, similar to those that would have been available at the time, similar to the ones that they had found. And they carved grooves into similar rock to identify how the scratches might have been made. They decided that the lines were most likely created by using a pointed tool or cutting edge to scrape repeatedly along and deepen, assisted by the actual groove that was created in the first place. It said, it said, that somebody working at this locality to create that groove, to create that groove would take 10 strokes, no, 100 strokes, no, 300 strokes to create that groove, smack bang in that locality. Does that indicate work in regards to processing meat in the same groove over and over again? I think not. I think the deliberate expression of the scratches in whatever form you may see fit. What is visible today is what we see, what we might understand. There's also the other argument. It's said that these are obviously symbolic. These are religious the typical term that we use in archaeology when we don't really understand what we're looking at. The engraving is at the point in the cave where the cave's orientation changes by 90 degrees and speculates whether the scratches were related to the location. Oh, location scratches in a cave as some kind of map. We did actually start over symbolic and religion there. Speculation does make you wonder. The marks might indicate this is where you are in the dark, 100 meters deep in the cave, and it would have been a lot caver back in the day. However, there's one thing in the notes that's very interesting. It's a fixed location. It's not a moment in time, it is time itself. It is the creation of time and a copy of time offered by us from our ancestors 39,000 years ago. It could be something to indicate to the people in the cave that somebody was already using it. Well, what do you do, Goal? Oh, no, so, oh God, I wish I'd even bothered reading that one. Um, oh, God. can you imagine that? To prove that somebody's using the cave, they've got to go 100 meters into the cave, 150 meters as it probably was then. And then they would touch the marks in the dark to indicate that somebody used the cave. Right, let's just move on from that one. That sounds absolute nuts. It takes more than a few scratches, deliberate or not, to identify symbolic behavior on the part of the Neanderthals 
or whoever created these in the first place. Do you know what we're going to do? Let's look at that girl. Let's see who she is, what she is, and what she can tell us. Let's get a little bit of understanding there. So, let's just get a little bit of image on her, and we'll go to... That's Margaret when you've upset her, because Margaret's got red hair as well. Um, or maybe that's Sandra when we've upset her. I've, I've seen Sandra upset. Um, the Neanderthals in Gibraltar could be said to be the first to be hominids to be discovered anywhere on the planet. The understanding of these so-called Neanderthals were the first hominids before our so-called type were ever discovered. And I've been among the most well studied from Gibraltar of their species anywhere on the planet. It's said, for example, that Gibraltar acted as a refuge for the shrinking Neanderthal populations across Europe. I find that absolute nonsense. I gotta be honest with you. However, one thing that's not nonsense about that is, is the, point, the point I'm gonna make, is the point I'm trying to make, is this is Gibraltar, the narrowest part, and it would have been much more narrower then, the narrowest part between Africa and Europe. And there's obviously talk at that stage that you may have been able to walk across anyway. So this is where those hybrid hominids would come into Europe. If you want to go along with what I'm saying, if you don't want to go along with what I'm saying, do you know what I need to do? I, I, I've been giving you I've been giving you my take and I've been giving my bias. And I've been saying, this is what I feel. There's no other way, right? I need to stop a minute and get my head out of the sand. And, I, and what I need to do is say this. That there's nothing wrong with thinking of waves of Neanderthals coming out of Africa, coming over to Europe and settling. And, but they would have eventually met other hominids. If you want to, if you want to do out of Africa and say that these Neanderthals came over as pure hominids, um, um, but they would have met other other hominids of Neand Denisovians, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens, even Homo erectuscenes. They, they, they would by that stage Homo erectuscenes were already interbred. If if you want to do the pure theory, I I don't have a problem with that, but it doesn't it doesn't stack up anymore. Okay. So I needed to take my bias out of that and just chuck that at you. Now, when we look at this skull, this was discovered at the Forbes quarry on Gibraltar. Let's look at the skull. Let's just go back and just look at her skull. This skull itself found at the Forbes Quarry in Gibraltar, not in 1928, not even close, 1848. And this skull itself is a known, classified as the skull of a Neanderthal woman discovered in a quarry in 1848, was only the second Neanderthal skull ever found and the first ne first adult Neanderthal skull to be discovered eight years before the discovery of the first Neanderthal skull at the Neanderthal Valley um, in Germany. Neander, Neander Valley, not Neanderthal Valley, the Neander Valley in Germany in, 18, in 1857. Oh. Now, we realized this was the skull. We it was probably thought that this was a skull of a of, of, of a pure modern hominid. 
but it had all the characteristics of um, having more Neanderthal characteristics than anything else. And the skull of a Neanderthal child was discovered nearby in 1926. Now, the, the Neanderthal, this, this skull itself um, was excavated by Dorothy Garrod. Um, and the, the skull itself is, is, is massively um, significant Ooh. of the child. Um, and it was it was a it was a male child, and, of, and most likely to be the offspring of this person with the skull. So the Anathors are known to have occupied ten sites on the Gibraltar Peninsula. That is just so it's quite heavily Neanderthaled. And the caves in the rock of Gibraltar that the Neanderthals inhabited have been excavated and have revealed a wealth of information, but a lot of data has been lost. The peninsula stood on the edge of a fertile coastal plain, now submerged, that supported a wide variety of animals and plants which the Neanderthals exploited. Unlike Northern Europe, which, which underwent massive swings in climate, and was largely uninhabitable for long periods, the far south of the Iberian Pen Peninsula enjoyed a stable and mild climate for over 125,000 years with animals and plants. Um, and it's this skull itself dates, we do believe, from around 42,000 years ago. Um, and one of, the, one of the arguments given to say that the Neanderthals as a as a strict species that that um, that was left alone, and you know, one of the arguments given is that the 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 remains that we do see associated with Gibraltar um, is that there was some kind of climate change and things massively altered um, in regards to. Of the Gibraltar Peninsula, and it, it, it was argued um, that that led to the extinction of um, the Neanderthals there. But uh, but this is not something that I follow. So so the the, the skull itself, uh, the the skull itself, um, it was realised not in 1848, but it was realised by 1862 after the discoveries in the Neanderthal Valley. That it was very different than than a modern Homo sapien skull, uh, characteristic of a race ex extending from the Rhine to the Pillars of Hercules. It said, so in other words, people have started linking in this skull with the discoveries in the Neander Valley. The skull was the first um, Neanderthal adult cranium ever to be discovered, and it's thought to have belonged to um, a woman due to its great. Um, 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 wonderful nice soft flowing features um and then a second one was found in 1926 the the, the younger one the 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 four-year-old child skull was not found in 1926 so this this is this is what's absolutely amazing about what we're finding um, in regards to this skull um and what what we can basically learn from it so what i'd like to do now um, I'd like to have a, a little break, um, but what we're going to do, we will ask if there are any nice little questions. So we're, we will stop that screen sharing for a moment. Um, we'll come on to that child and then we'll come on to that find in Romania. And then we've got one other one other snippet for you. So if we go to there and we go to um, there. Um, and right, shoot. Are there any questions, darlings? How old did you say the skull was? Um, the, the the this the 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 skull the skull that we've just looked at. It's at least thirty nine thousand years oh, old. Okay. More likely to be, well, forty two thousand years old. But we we know that um, uh, we we've we've got we've got evidence um, of this sort of Neanderthal landscape so more coming towards forty two thousand years old that's when the skull like dates too okay thank you 
Right, Andy, Gina. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, those stone markings are very interesting because we found a stone at Beetham with exactly the same ones on. Wow. Yeah, which was on top of one of the burials, which Ooh. has caused some questions about the date of the burials. And we were yeah. arguing about the same thing you were just talking about there then. How, could they be random? Could it be agricultural tools? Yeah. this? Or is it, and I'm going, no, look, they're, 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 they're the same distance apart. They're, Mark, they're, they're almost at 90 degrees, but they weren't. They were at a slight angle, just like that one was. Yeah. That's really so interesting. I'll be sending a link over to the uh, the archaeologist about that. <laughs> oh, well done. And you, you might be more favourable then than uh, Claire. Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know you might you might get all the gigs so if we haven't got any, any andy please do that so obviously uh the scratch marks in in our cave in gibraltar yeah really interesting cave. marks yeah they're vir virtually identical yes yeah. and obviously we, as we said they would it would take incredible effort over 300 mm. sort of back and forth mm. to actually create those marks which which is yeah. which is so when you think when Obviously yeah. went on holiday to be them or was in be them went on holiday to Gibraltar. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and he took his missus with him who had red hair. That's right. <laughs> and do you think it was a game board, something like that? Not so oh curious. god, we can imagine that flipping egg. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Okay. Year old dots and crosses or something. Mm. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but bit, bit sort of you know what we're going to do? We're going to we're going to spend a few hours creating this huge gouge into the rock, right? And then we're going to spend another whole day doing the other gouge, um, and then knots and crosses with a cross. <laughs> it's quite a basic foot game, Andy, but we'll give it a go. If you put a knot there and somebody puts a cross there, <laughs> and you put a knot there, then the person who starts with a knot wins a game every time. Hmm. Yeah. But one, of the the problems is, one of the problems is wouldn't the noughts and crosses they were creating make marks as well? Or would they would they have chalk? I mean, you can't imagine what they'd be yeah, doing their noughts and crosses. Oh, yeah. Just think <laughs> what Andy said is just too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> They've got to do something in all the winter evenings, haven't they? Yeah. What not what spend a whole several days doing a board and then realising that... Well, yes, yes. But well, they've got, what, four like months the, I mean, if darkness. you find two like that, spread like that, it have obviously has some great meaning to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those distances they, apart. They were just sharpening a, a tool, do you think? Well, could be. <laughs> Maybe their the way problem. of counting and recording things. Uh, yeah. I, I'm still with the yeah. Norse and Crosses games, guys. <laughs> I, 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 you, you can you can imagine it now, can you? We'll, we'll do a bit of a demo. Right? Yeah. The, the person spent spent like a whole day doing a line down there, going back and forth. I know. And, and another <coughs> like this, cool. and somebody says, "Oh, what we'll do? We'll put a cross there, right?" We'll put a pen out now. But we'll put a cross there, and the other guy goes, "Oh, right. We'll put a note there. Oh, this is a good game." And the other one goes, "Yeah, good game." I spent three days doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it was the origin of hopscotch. If it was on the floor. Oh, how small do you think these people oh, are? <laughs> For God's sake, shut up, all of you. Right, okay. Um, Margaret, is there anything <laughs> sensible you want to say before I lose the plot? Well, I remember seeing a programme on the television many moons ago about these um, caves oh, in Gibraltar. And yeah. uh, they found um, evidence of a, an injured Neanderthal male. Uh, he was so badly injured, he wouldn't have been able to hunt. Uh, he couldn't even yeah. walk, but he lived for many, many yeah. years after. Oh, the no, this is the, yeah, yeah, this is the one that um, in, in, in northern Iraq. Oh, yeah. I thought it was Gibraltar. Yeah. No, that was northern Iraq, lovely. It was found yeah. in 1956 in northern Iraq. It was... Um, yeah, and they um, said he was, Shannon, he'd been looked after yeah. and fed. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah. yeah. Years. yeah. 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 Shannon de Cave. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. So, um, right, anyway, well, I've lost the plot. Right, um, 
Right, who else has got left? Pete, want to say anything? <laughs> Not really. You might see me moving about a bit because I'm having difficulty sitting still. Well, I told I told you not to eat that raw meat, um, Pete. You've got worms. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, okay. What What else have we got? Um, who else is left? Do you want to say anything, Jess, before we have a break? No, it was definitely an interesting one. Um, yeah. Thank you, Carl. It really has given me a lot to think about. Yeah. So 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 it certainly it certainly should. So it certainly should. Uh, right. Okay. Um, Right, so what we want to do is, um, uh, Pat, anything you'd like to say, darling? No? I think she's gone to sleep. I <laughs> know oh, she hasn't. She's still there, but I'm just trying to wind her up. Your mic's right. off, Pat. Mike's, Mike's off, Pat. Who, who, who's Mike? Oh, uh, Mike's off, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I do apologise. I'm losing my voice. I better not talk. <laughs> oh, do, do, you know, do you know your daughter? Just do, is she that talkative? <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> what, what do you get to talk about with her? Right, okay then. Because uh, you know, Amer <laughs> America has no history, is it? So they can't be talking about history. <laughs> Right. Okay. Then. Right. We'll we'll take a little bit of a break now, and we'll uh, we'll be, we'll be back. So I I will um I I okay. will be back. I'm just gonna yes. See you in a minute, guys. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah.
Oh, perfect. Okay. Are we going to be meeting at Drina's in uh, every week, Andy? Or no, is... hang on a minute. It's only for Andy and Drina. Well, what what gives you the right to even presume you can go over there? <laughs> well, it would be nice. Yeah, but hang on. It's, it's you know don't 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 break up a loving couple, eh? You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, you know, two's company, three's a crowd, and all the rest of it. You know, I, you, you know, I, you, you well, just a very just, presumption. It wouldn't just be me; it would be Anne, and it would be David as well. Who said Anne could be invited? The old oh, days. My God, what are you doing? You're inviting everyone over, all the blooming waifs and strays over Drina's house, flipping heck. It'll turn out to be a right knocking shop. You'll have Claire wandering in next. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, yeah. yeah, that would be a really good idea, actually. It would be nice, yeah. Well, I tell you what. Um, be, well, what, what we will do after what we will do when we come back in about five Look minutes. That. They've got the cakes and everything. All right, I will. I will discuss. I, you know, I wrote. I've written the name Cave down instead of Cake. <laughs> Eggs, <Exit>, Trina. <All> right. <laughs> Yeah, we have got a bit to get through, and I've, I've got to make sure that we we try and finish because I've got to, um, I've got to get up to uh, Monmouth. Oh. And, and what I want to do is mention um, mention uh, a, a female archaeologist called um, Sylvia Benton and uh, I, I just wanted to chuck her in there um, and it, 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 it is relevant and she 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 did lots of cave work as well so I'm going to try and get her in there um, and I just I, I've got to I've got to run outside now and I've got to just quickly do some things with the animals so I'm just going to um, I've just remembered I want to get an image of her. It's Sylvia Benton. There we go. We'll get an image of her. Oh, there she is. Looks about like you, Drina. Can't see there anything. you go. No, I know you can't see anything. Don't You're not meant to see anything, you know? You get very agitated, you do, love. <laughs> no, it was just a, 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 a lot. All right, I've got to do this now. I got. I got. I'll be back. I'll be back. Mm. 
todo lo que Cristo. He was being called Margaret. Yeah. I've been seeing Joyce for opposite you out, out and about quite a few times recently. I thought she was like stuck in the house and never came out anymore. Yeah, she was until recently. She's just had um, a hips replaced and uh -huh. she just seems to have suddenly got more cheerful. Yeah, she was. She was really chatty. It was nice yeah. to see her. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, we're having a street party on the 5th for the Queen's um, Platinum Jubilee, and she's she's going to be the cake tester. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good job to get, isn't it? <laughs> taste them and see who's the best. Anything down our end? Uh, well, good. there's going to be a bit of the sports. Uh, but we're it's doing just on our close and she's um, very involved with that. Good. So she she used to get involved in stuff a lot. Yeah, it's nice to see her up normal. There's a do on the field as well, I think, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Uh, yeah. But we're going to go ahead and have our little one on the close. I think there's about 24 of us. Right. So it should, should be good. If you want to come along, oh, that's very kind. Might let you. you have a slice of cake if you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Jubilee cake. Yeah, well, we've got to do competition for the best decorated cake, the best portrait of the Queen, um, right. with, <laughs> or the corgis, whatever, <laughs> some kind of royal connection. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we're planning all kinds of things, so it should be good. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope the Queen lives that long. She's not very well, is she? Lego. It's Lego, yeah. yeah. Well, it's sort of Lego, not yeah. quite. No, I couldn't crazy. quite finish it to get the balloons balanced. The sort of right. sort of, you've got to get mm. them balanced. Well, it looks like stay. it's just about to go off. It's good. Yeah, it is. It's probably all of, yeah, a little bit. If you want to oh. borrow any of these books from my garage, you're very right. welcome. Well, it's anything to get people over there, isn't it, Margaret? Right, let's get started again. Um, At a reasonable rate. Yeah. Can I tell you about rate. the sheep? Right. What? Can I, I in this book, in this anti they're really good. It tells you all about sheep from thousands of years ago. Oh and right, nice. They the lambs used to be suckled by women. Wow. Yeah. Laws so, against that. There's, there's definitely laws against that. Flip an egg. Yeah, they were caught as hunting decoys or pets and then suckled by women. And Christ. the young animal would have become attached to the foster mother. Bloody uh, hell, what, what the mum? What, what? The, the lamb would become attached to the person who had suckled oh, it, the baby, thinking it was that? its mother. Mm -hmm. So it was saying the domestication of sheep was done by women in the home and not by men the hunter. Ah, no, ah, right, yeah, that's, that makes sense, yeah, good. Yeah. You take it. So, so is that the type of thing that you would do, uh, Margaret, circle of sheep? Well, it just, just shows, isn't it? I wonder what else they suckled. Right, let's just move on. And we're moving on now. Right, yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, Margaret. Right, so apparently, uh, Drina has now invited everybody over her house. <laughs> Um, well, thanks for inviting everybody, Andy. So where are they all going to go? Where, where would they like to go to, Andy? David and Anne and Margaret, whose house? Oh, see this. Where are we? We've got the no, microphone where, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know yet. I, 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 I did it as an emergency because my, my um, broadband broke down. Mm. So is this Drina's computer? No, it's Andy's. Oh. Well, we're on both. We're, got, we're talking through Drina's, and I've got mine on, but the sound system is not working because it's not updated enough. I probably get it work. Well, you could do, Andy. You could have one no. computer screen for watching us, uh, one computer screen for people to see you, the other one for you to hear and listen. It'd be quite good. You yeah. Could have, you could, yeah. Um, right, OK, Andy. Well, you can have a chat with everybody about that next week, can't you? Anyway, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I, I've lost the world to live. Any, and Margaret, do you oh, want to say anything cool. else about books before actually... we crack on? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, um, I'm enjoying uh, reading them all. Good. Yeah, I've just got another 275 to go. <laughs> <laughs> You've only read one, haven't you? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, that, that's good. Anyway, thanks for looking after us, uh, for, um, Margaret. We've got a plan. So uh, what else was I going to say? Um, right. So obviously try and work out um, who to stay at and where, whatever, and uh, maybe have a chat about that next week. Good idea, Andy? Yeah. All right. I don't think Andy's talking to me now. Margaret? Yeah. Well, is it me or I'm I'm talking to people and nobody's taking any notice to me? I think I think Andy's got problems with the sound or something. Well, they've I'm glad got, somebody else has got, got two problems. devices on the go. And and you muted Drina. No, I haven't muted Drina. They've well, got, she oh. looks like she's muted. Well, Drina's always. I'm muted. saying I'm saying that's why we might not be able to hear him. When, when Drina's why, in a why, why do we need to be unmuted? Hey. <laughs> right, guys, guys, let's crack on. Anyway, let's move on. Right, okay. Um, what, what, what I'd like us to do now is I'd like to um, discuss a little bit uh, about a find made in Gibraltar in connection with a crossbreed, and, and we'll just have a look a little bit at the publicity uh, which, which is offered towards that. Um, so it, it's just to do with a tooth, actually, but it's quite an important tooth. 
So if we do that, and we do this, and we do that, so obviously we've done the skull there. So we can, that's the skull that we've looked at. Uh, we've done the scratches. We've looked at that one. Uh, we are to look at that article there, which is um, um, about uh, Romania. And we're going to mention this woman, Sylvia Benton, an inspiration for Jess, she shall be. Jess, you've got another 70 years to go in archaeology before you can uh, beat Sylvia Benton's record. Um, so this is this article here. I, I, I remember reading this when it came out. Um, it's associated with this cave. And I said that no hominid artifacts have been found in this cave up until this find. Yeah, it, and you can see somebody there going into the cave. There they are. So Neanderthals, Neanderthal child tooth found in Gibraltar cave, Gorham's cave. That's the one with the carvings in the rock. So there it is. Nice little bit of a view there. There's Gorham's cave on the left. The discovery earlier this month, and when does this date to? Five years ago. So 19, um, 2017. Uh, the discovery earlier this month of a Neanderthal child's upper right canine milk tooth. Note the way this is written. In part of Gibraltar's historical Gorham Cave complex. Note, not only has um, not only has the archaeological world um, a gog, uh, but also underscores the rock's significant place in the story of man. Though the 50,000-year-old tooth, so that's older than, you know, the, 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 the hominid, the, the other, because I, I mentioned earlier on that we, we had the mother 42,000 years and there was another set of human remains, which was... Um, well, was it five-year-old boy um, associated there? But this here, um, though the fifty-thousand-year-old tooth was found in what is thought to be a hyena's lair. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Experts confirmed that it belonged to a human child. Hang on a minute. The headlines say Neanderthal. There you go. Uh, it's even the person writing this. There's a bit of confusion. Uh, belonged to a human child aged four to five years, possibly part of the animal's grim prey, which showed characteristic Neanderthal features. So you can see where we've gone with this article. One minute it's a Neanderthal child, the next minute it's a human child, but then it's a human child with Neanderthal features. Yeah. So, so that's a four to five year old. That's the different from the skull that we've mentioned associated with that mother from 42,000 years ago. Mm. Uh, so this is the tooth right it's quite it's a it's a very modern human looking tooth but it's got neanderthal characteristics associated with the tooth and neanderthal dna uh so it's a canine now if we go back to the word neanderthal the tooth continues a string of neanderthal finds which last year led to the gorham's cave complex being declared a unesco world heritage site and it has helped stimulate a new public enthusiasm for visits to the cave complex where extensive evidence of neanderthal life including rare pointers to their diet um as well as the use of bird feathers and abstract rock engravings which suggest an intelligent far superior uh, to that of the earliest hominids. Um, and it goes on to say the cave named after Gorham, which we've already done in 907, who left his name and the date um, in uh, date in lamp uh, black on a wall, was largely uh, forgotten um, until proper excavations began. And it was talking about the Go Dorothy Garrow stuff. Um, so there's, there's that tooth there. Um, it goes on, an international multidisciplinary research project has unveiled uh, the vital importance of the site to our understanding of a critical juncture in human evolution and the Neanderthals in particular. Now there is a wealth of information on where and how Neanderthals are early. Now this is where it links here. Early modern humans lived and behaved. What plants, birds, and animals, so modern humans have been chucked in it as well, where they acquired materials for stone tools and what their environment was like. There is evidence of their complex social behavior. 
their dress and ornamentation. Talk about the the, the flowers and you know uh, not the flowers. Oh yeah, this is they've also found evidence of flowers in the cave. I was thinking about the feathers though. Um, although there is archaeological evidence of a coexistence between the early ancestors of modern man and their predecessors, the Neanderthals, the latter steadily declined. Did it? Did it? Now, this was written in 2017. And where's this date of 36,000 years come from? This last pocket of early Stone Age people uh, uh, were the remainder of a human species who had occupied caves on the rock for as much as 100,000 years. So there's the excavations in Gorham's cave. There it is. It looks actually quite cushy, doesn't it? Andy, mm -hmm. could we book some tickets? We'd have a great time over there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, me and Andy can talk about I would just excavate all day there and just do like a tiny little millimetre and that would be great. If Claire got in there, we wouldn't near the end of it. Um, um, blah, 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 blah. It, it's talking a little bit more about the, um, talking about uh, the, this this area in front that they, that they lived in was reclaimed by the sea and this fertile area lost. And uh, we're talking about sort of people living there for over a hundred thousand years. And we've done all that there. Um, so, um, yes, it's talking about another type of hominid there, the Homo um, cal calipicus. Yes, so people keep coming up with these names and uh, really nice little article there. But what I want to do is go on to the next piece, right? We've done all that there, so you don't need to read it. But um, what I'd like to do is go on to the next piece. So we go out of here now and we go there and we delete that there. And now where we're going to do is sex and intrigue. We're going to go on to, then we're going to go on to Sylvia Benton. No link with the sex and intrigue. And then we're going to finish on one cave that we haven't done. That's got great Paleolithic evidence and it leads us directly to the Mesolithic period. So we've got to go with, hang on a minute. Right, what, what we're going to do, we, we've got to, um, which one am I going to use here? Oh, him. Right. Margaret, do you fancy a date with him? He's a bit rugged, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, hang on. Women say that about me, but I've, I've had loads of luck with women. <laughs> anyway, except for except for Jess, I did try. I gave up on her. But OK, um, right. Now, this article here right, is as follows. Now, I, I read this and I thought this is right up your street. It's definitely up, right up Margaret Street. But I want to do this in a nice, nice way and not be a bit too sordid. But the headlines are, here's what we know sex with Neanderthals was like. OK, that's the image I've got here. Scientists know a surprising amount about the titillating episode in human history when our species got together, including whether we kissed and the nature of their sexual organs. We're going to Romania, um, and here we go. Uh, uh, Margaret, look deep into his eyes. Are you ready? Margaret and this bloke, their eyes met across the rugged mountain landscape of prehistoric Romania. He was a Neanderthal and stark naked, apart from a fur cape. He had good posture and pale skin, perhaps reddened slightly with sunburn. Around one, is it, one of his thick muscular biceps, he wore a bracelet of eagle talons. She, Margaret, was an early modern human clad in an animal skin coat with a wolf fur trim. She had dark skin, long legs, and her hair was worn in braids. He cleared his throat. La 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 la! Looked her up and down and in an absurdly high pitched nasal voice deployed his best chat up line. Oh, how you doing, babe? He <laughs> stared back blankly. No, hang on a minute. She stared back blankly. Well, as you would. <clears throat> Luckily for him, they didn't speak the same language. They had an awkward laugh. And well, we can all guess what happened next. Flipping egg, that was quick. <laughs> Margaret, you don't waste any time. 
That, I believe they did, did. They didn't have vocal cords like ours. They could only kind of whistle, couldn't they? Ah, Margaret, no, no, they were able to speak. We worked worked that one out. <clears throat> uh, uh, this was this was. I think when me and Andy were doing um, this about two thousand and twelve, when we were still in the same room with them, I think they started to come out with the thing that Neanderthals could actually speak. You know, they yeah. We, we can you remember doing that, Andy. Yeah, they, they, through the DNA analysis now, they reckon they could actually sing. So yeah. they could charm them. <clears throat> oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a wonderful gay day. Uh -huh. There you go. That, does that put them, connect them more with the Welsh then, you think? Have you got very far with that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have got very far. Apparently, apparently, when I'm dressed up as a pirate in in um, in Newquay, I attract women like um, like Pat and her daughter. <laughs> and that's a fact. Anyway, stop interrupting. Of course, it could have been far less like a scene from a steamy romantic novel. Perhaps the woman was actually the Neanderthal and the man belonged to our own species. Uh -huh. Maybe their relationship was of the casual, pragmatic kind because there were just, because um, there just weren't many people around at the time. You had to take what you could get. It's even been suggested too that such hookups weren't consensual. Oh, that spoiled the blooming story, isn't it? <laughs> Being jumped on by a Neanderthal woman with red hair. Christ. <laughs> well, don't get too excited. While we will never know what really happened uh, in this encounter or others like it, what we can be sure of is that such a couple did get together. Now, this is why we were doing Romania. I've mentioned it a number of times, right? Around 37 to 42,000 years later, in February 2002, on the 14th of August at 12.15, two explorers made an extraordinary discovery in an underground cave system in the Carpathian Mountains, looking for Vlad the Impaler. Even getting there was no easy task. First, they waded neck deep in an underground river for 201 metres. Then came a scuba dive for 30 metres along an underwater passage, followed by a 300 metre uh, ascent up to the mouse hole, an opening through which they entered a previously unknown chamber. Flipping egg. I've, I've, already, I've already turned back. Cave with bones, which basically um, Pestera Cue Oasi. Cave with bones. I pronounce that in a Spanish way, but it's Romanian. They found thousands of mammalia bones. Over its long history, it's thought to have primarily been inhabited by male cave bears. Oh. Uh, extinct, ex extinct relatives of the brown bear to which they largely belong. Resting on the surface among them was a human jawbone. It was probably his, after um, Margaret had, had sort of beaten him up, which radiocarbon dating revealed to be from one of the oldest known early modern humans in Europe. What type of human was he, though? There we go. The remains are thought to have, have washed inside the cave naturally and lain undisturbed ever since. At the time, scientists noticed that while the jawbone was unmistakably modern in its appearance, here we go, let's do the drum roll. It also contained some unusual Neanderthal-like features. Years later, this hunch was confirmed. So in, every, in other words, where we've been leading has actually brought us to this. When scientists analysed DNA extracted from the find in 2012, they found that the individual was male and likely to have been up to 9% Neanderthal. Can we just think of that a minute? Uh, it's two th we're talking about, if we round it up to 40,000 years ago, right? The individual's jawbone is up to 9% Neanderthal. That means that 
people had been interbreeding across the board for tens of thousands of years. My point is finally proven. Mm -hmm. This is the highest concentration ever encountered in a modern human at 40,000 years ago, and around three times the amount found in modern day humans, which is, which is around 3% Neanderthal. All of us have around 3% Neanderthal. In Margaret's case, 10. Sorry, Margaret, I just I, 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 had, I didn't have Claire to pick on today, I'm sorry. Uh, because the genome contained large stretches of uninterrupted Neanderthal sequencing, the authors calculated that the JAWS owner is likely to have had a Neanderthal ancestor as recently as four to six generations ago. Oh, you know, 40,000 years ago. Hmm. Equivalent to a great, great grandparent or great, great, great grandparent they determined that the liaison probably occurred fewer than 200 years before the time he had lived. So even my estimates are wrong. In addition to the jawbone, the team found skull fragments from another Neanderthal type in the cave. It wasn't a one-off. In fact, if you put all these together, none of this is a one-off. The evidence of Pod knew it. The evidence against cover is too much of it. This other bone had similar features in the DNA. Scientists have not yet been able to extract DNA um, from that set of remains. Um, when it says there's similar mixture, right, I, yeah, I think... Um, they, they haven't got the DNA. I think that's what that means. It's not, it's not a full DNA sequence that they've got. <clears throat> it's thought that they may have belonged to someone who had recent Neanderthal an ancestry. So in other words, we've got two sets of bones. And uh, you've got two sets of bones that have got Neanderthal traits. Now, Neanderthal DNA can be found in everyone alive today, including people of African descent, whose ancestors aren't thought to have come into contact with this group directly. Whoa. Since then, the evidence that, um, that sex between early modern humans and Neanderthals was not a rare event has been mounting up. Hidden in the genomes of present day populations, there are many telltale signs that it happened on many separate occasions across this sort of northern hemisphere. To this day, there are people carrying genetic material from at least two different populations of Neanderthals, which are seen to be extensively interbreeding. And uh, Margaret, yeah. you know you mentioned the Altai Mountains earlier on in yeah. Siberia. Stop looking at my notes, love. In fact, the Neanderthal DNA can be found in everyone alive today. Though whose ancestors aren't thought, uh, right, start again. Everyone alive today, I just repeated myself then. And the transfer also happened the other way around. In 2016, scientists discovered that Neanderthals from the Altai Mountains of Siberia may have shared 7% of their gen genetics with the ancestors of modern humans who lived roughly 100,000 years ago. Crucially, though, you might think the um, salacious details of these ancient liaisons have been lost to prehistory, but they are now coming out today. We're now understanding them. An anthropologist from Pennsylvania University um, um, in 2017 discovered the ghostly signature of a microscopic 48,000 year old hitchhiker clinging to a prehistoric tooth. This is something else now. I look at ancient microbes as a way of learning more about the past and den dental um, calculus is really the only reliable way to reconstruct the microorganisms that lived within ancient humans. She was particularly interested in what Neanderthals were eating and how they interacted with the environment. To find out, she sequenced DNA from the dental plaque on teeth found in three different caves. Now, again, 
this is all interesting, massively interesting stuff. We're not going to do all of this, but we'll just do this little bit here because I want to do Victoria Cave. Two other samples were taken from among 13 Neanderthals found in the El Cidron cave system in Spain. The site was recently beset by intrigue when it was revealed that many of those individuals seem to have suffered from congenital abnormalities, such as misshapen kneecaps and vertebrae and baby teeth, which had remained long after childhood. The group is suspected to have, to have com composed of close relatives who had accumulated um, recessive genes after a long history of interbreeding. The family met an unfortunate end. Their bones are etched with telltale signs that they were cannibalized. It's thought that they were among the last Neanderthals to uh, walk the earth, but we don't know that. Now, what, what, they, what they have been <laughs> doing is to try and look at these microorganisms. Um, and it's said that she's looking into these microorganisms so much I, I, this is this is this is so this is so amazing. Um, when you kiss someone, oral microbes will go back and forth between your mouths. It could have happened once, but then sort of been somehow magically propagated. If it happened that the group of people who were infected went on to be very successful, but it could also be something that occurred more regularly. So what we're talking about, we're talking about microbes passing in the mouth passing on various sort of things microorganisms uh, that could technically assist um humans um neanderthals and whoever um there's one last thing that i, I want to mention is 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 here right because this is a, a massively long article it's huge Right. It mentions those Denisovians. In 2008, archaeologists discovered a broken finger bone on a, uh, and a single molar in, in, the, uh, in an Altai mountain cave. No, the De Denisovia cave that we mentioned last week, from which a brand new species of humans was revealed. Um, and this is where we get the Denisovians from. Um, the, the word Denisovians has only been with us since 2008. Um, so these these Denisovians um, uniquely identified um, a separate species from being Neanderthal or um, Homo sapiens sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens. There's lots of there's lots going to be more hominids to be found out there, um, and they're also they're also looking at um, whether these sexual encounters um, were responsible for passing on sexually transmitted diseases. But as this article is so long, we'll leave that one there. Um, and it's an absolutely fascinating article. And I mentioned this as well. Uh, the article is called, uh, well, the, the article is, um, here's what we know um, sex with Neanderthals was like. It's on the BBC website. Um, and it's dated the 13th of January, 2021. So if anyone wants to catch, catch that one, this is the image that you see. So one last thing I want to do is the Victoria Cave tonight, and that bring the end of our Paleolithic period. Um, and what we need to do is <clears> there. <throat> oh, we haven't done this, young lady. Let's do her first. Um, and this 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 young lady um, has excavated a lot of caves. Um, she's actually a fellow of the so uh, Scottish Society of Antiquaries. This is why I actually come across her. Um, she lived between um, 18th of August 1887 and the 12th of September 1985. Um, so you can work out she was bloody old. Um, and I'm going to say that because she did archaeology until the very last days. Um, she, uh, she became a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London in 1937, the Scottish Antiquaries in 1928. This is significant. Because even in the late 1880s, women were not allowed to be members of um, the Society of Scottish Antiquaries. Now, but she was in the 1820s. So, um, Sylvia Benton, she studied classics at Cambridge, um, which she attended up until 1910. Um, and she, she 
classically studied archaeology. She traveled to Greece in the um, 1920s. Um, she studied uh, um, she studied in Greece in um, 1928 um, and she started um, working extensively on her own in the mountains of Greece in 1929 um, and she would look into lots of caves. She, con she continually worked um, in Greece in the 1930s. In 1928 she started looking into a cave in Scotland in, um, uh, called Sculptor's Cave. And in Sculptor's Cave in the Moray Firth in Scotland, she discovered evidence of human occupation dating to the Bronze Age and evidence in the Moray Firth in Scotland dating to the Roman period also. She also started to uncover um, various remains in this cave, Sculptor's Cave, uncovering various halves of various other evidence, including medieval archaeology in the cave. She did return to Greece and she continued working and she actually excavated on the islands of the Kynthos, where I've actually been in 1934. Um, so she worked extensively and she was she was very much um, uh, focused on writing as well. She did complete her work associated with Sculptor's Cave. And interesting enough, Sculptor's Cave in Scotland, she went back 50 years later and excavated in the Mori First Sculptor's Cave in 1979, when she was 92 years old, where she directed an archaeological excavation. And she would climb high up on scaffolding to view the excavations, to monitor the progress of archaeologists working under her. So she was, um, she actually continued working in archaeology until 1984. And in one year later, in 1985, she died at the grand old age, um, all those years in archaeology at the age of 98. So Jess, you've got you've got a lot of time in archaeology yet before you can even get to this uh, this <laughs> this lady's amazing triumph. Um, and so um, she was working in archaeology she was, until she was ninety seven years old. Very inspirational woman. Massively inspirational. Um, and look at that book there. That 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 there she is. Um, and and I think she's. She was in the care home for the last um, year of her life. Um, I think, yeah, I think that is. I'm not exactly sure. Massively inspirational. Massively. And there she is looking at the pottery. I tell you what, can you imagine a 97-year-old lecturing us? And we want to have a word in edgeways, um, Jessica. <laughs> but, uh, you'd have to listen to Jessica. She's got more wisdom than, than anyone, right? So... So there you there you go. And one one last thing I'd like to do is this one. It's uh, Victoria Cave. Now I've been a bit bit lazy today, but um, what what we'll do? Um, I've got my notes of Victoria's Victoria Cave here, so I'm going to get these up on my screen. Uh, so this is up in um, Yorkshire. I told you there'd be one more uh, Paleolithic site that we did in Britain, um, and there it is. So we've got, um, we're, we're up in Yorkshire and it says it, um, it, um, in southern Lancashire and Cheshire. Um, so this is Victoria Cave, Paleolithic Yorkshire. Oh, so uh, in, obviously including a bit of uh, Yorkshire as well. Um, we're deposited, um, it's talking about gravels and sands deposited 28,000 years ago. Uh, associated with this landscape, we, we, it says we know that um, uh, this Scandinavian ice, uh, perhaps 50 miles off the present east coast, deflected the ice flow. And we're, we're talking about some sort of great details about uh, the ice and the tundra and the landscape, which you can obviously come on to yourself. Um, so you can get to this article. But what I'd like to do is this. Um, the nitty gritty of Victoria Cave. And if we, I don't think we can enlarge on that, unfortunately. Victoria Cave, um, although Victoria Cave um, was excavated um, in the 
1870s. Um, it was first discovered as it's got there in 1838. And interestingly, um, it's got there a Michael Horner who was walking his dog over settled scars, followed the dog into a small opening which widened into a chamber, typ typical like cave discovery. There he was able to collect off the floor a number of objects which he showed to his employer, a Joseph Jackson. Now, the person usually credited with the cave's discovery. So this Michael Horner, although he made the discovery, the discovery was given to his employer, Joseph Jackson. Jackson collected more material from the cave. And in the following 30 years, a number of small excavations were undercovered there and, and undertaken there. The excavation was de, uh, the excavations in the 1870s, 1872, uh, and, and the finds that we're looking at rather interestingly find um, these 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 things here are called antler rods. So we're coming into the late period of the Paleolithic is where I wanted to be. Formally discussed, um, uh, the, these it it was it was thought formally discussion about these as harpoons and other early projectile points from the caves were compiled. But we now know, we now know from radiocarbon dates that these date to, um, hang on, the date should be there. Yeah, the, the radiocarbon dates, it says, um, we're, we're looking at around 14,000 years ago, 2000 years before the end of our ice age. Um, so these, these two pieces of rods of reindeer antler were found in a cave in the 1870s. Now, what we've also got is um, what's referred to here um, as a cut marked horse vertebrae, which was also found in 1870. Uh, it record, records the removal of the head of a wild horse using stone tools. So we've got evidence in this bone of stone tools being used. I haven't got an image of it. It is the only such bone with evidence of butchery from the cave um, from 14,500 years ago. <clears throat> Most of what we do find is, is that there's, there's lots of bones there, but not bones that have been butchered, showing signs of Feasting, feasting upon bones from the cave um, um, from different animals. Um, it mentioned those harpoons earlier on. The, these are rods, but we've got a clear harpoon here. Uh, rather nicely shaped. What this is doing in a cave is anybody's business. Um, so the well-known um, harpoon antler point from Victoria Cave, also found in the 1870s, this dates to around 12,000 years ago. So smack at the point that the ice is melting. Um, there, it also says that um, other artifacts were being found. Um, and it's got that there. Has it got that there? Yeah, no, it hasn't. Other artifacts have been, been found associated with Victoria Cave. Uh, indicating that we've we've got various artifacts um, associated uh, with this late Paleolithic period, <clears throat> and what we've got there um, is what would be interpreted as a, a bonefish lance, um, and I'm not exactly sure where we're getting the evidence for that, but uh, that's what that's saying. And also the other thing as well is that we've been completely amiss. What they've actually done as well, this is this is my note. They've actually done a, a virtual um, cave so people can explore the cave. And what we can say here is cave bears. In a recent comprehensive study of ancient cave bears, um, particularly here, um, it shows that it, a very interesting thing. We, we don't mention animals as much as we should. 
A recent comprehensive study of ancient cave bears remains found in Yorkshire, this cave, an island. An analysis of radiocarbon dates has shown that bears moved back into Yorkshire after the last glaciation and were all descended from single groups of bears from Spain. Um, what um, One last thing that they're saying is uh, we, we, we haven't done this, but we, we will. We, we haven't mentioned bears at all, really. They're saying out of all the bears that they've been finding evidence for in Ireland and this cave, it's strange that we're ending the Paleolithic period on bears, but there you go. 16 remains of bears being found in Yorkshire and Star Car, which we will be coming on over the next few weeks. Um, and it said that we've got bears present in these areas um, from um, 14 and a half thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've got caves in this area um, at the end of the Ice Age. Um, so it looks like they probably moved out of the area as things got really cold um, and they moved back in. So we've got evidence, lots of evidence of, of cave, um, of these cave bears and particularly at Star Car that we'll do um, in the next few weeks. So on that note, uh, we've ended, we've done a tiny little quick thing on Victoria Cave. I know that was only brief, but the information's there for you to look at. I wanted to just do that quick. So I've done everything that I wanted to do on the Paleolithic period now. Um, so the only thing I need to do is ask if there are any questions. Uh -huh. Right. Um, you go Sorry, are we going to get asked who wants to talk? Or can I just talk? If you go on the internet and do Inside Gorham's Cave, yeah. can you do that? Yes. Right, okay. Right, okay. Right. Okay. Um, direct me. Um, inside... In, inside Gorham's Cave. Okay. Go... And then you want images. Images, yeah. And you will yeah. find the marking on the cave floor. But we did actually show that, didn't we? No, no, it, this is, this is better. Oh, oh, come on, this is not a competition, love. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, you know, Drina, you don't need to knock me down with a smelly kipper and say that I found something better than you. <laughs> but it, it, the image but is it important because is... it shows it's a map. Go on, keep going. More. It's a map. It's a map. Yeah, keep going. There. There, there on the left. Or on my left, anyway. Yeah. There, that's the yeah. one. Isn't it interesting? It's well, identical it's to the cave like marking. Map, isn't it? Um, yeah, that is. It, it, it looks, yeah, it looks like a cave map. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that, you know, you think that, that map in France or wherever it is up in the Alp, on the hills of the, of the valley, yeah. the Bronze Age, isn't it? that goes back way before that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cave map. That looks like a cave map. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating, isn't Too it? Too close to be anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and why not? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's quite something, isn't it? Yeah. That is. I tell you, I tell you what, can you imagine that, right? Going back 20 years ago, if somebody said that that's a map and it was done by Neanderthals, they, they would have thought you were talking about Von Danikens and Chariot. <laughs> yeah. They would have. It would have everything about Neanderthals and our development and who we are has completely changed. It's been a revolution over the past 10 years. So, folks, um, right. Uh, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll come off that now. Thank you for that, Drina. Thank you for the sharing that with us. Um, Drina's going to say I've, I've got a better Im image of you, uh, <laughs> but we won't go. Right, Andy and Drina, anything else you want to say before we finish there? No, no thanks. No. Very interesting. And and 
I, I am going to not tell you what we're going to do next week because I've got to sit down uh, and I've got to really make the the Mesolithic period begin. And that chart that, that uh, I was meant to be sent, uh, completing that sheet that I've been working on in connection with this stuff that you wanted. So you'll have that hopefully to start with next week. Uh, I'll do it alongside the letter that I've got to write to Princess Anne. Um, and uh, yes, anything else you want to say, Andy? No, thanks. No. You don't need to ask me why I'm writing a letter to the Princess Anne. I don't really care. Um, Drina, um, <laughs> what, what, why are you writing the letter to Princess Anne? Oh, because she's the <laughs> chancellor of my university. She's, she's the ch chancellor of my university, and there's something I want to ask her. Um, um, what? Well, you she, can't she, stop. Was, she was very keen. Well, the, what happened with my PhD is it it uh, it all went tits up with COVID, and uh, I need to get back into it. And uh, Prince Anne is the chancellor of my university. And I'm going to I'm going to send her a little letter and say, do you remember that chap who was who talked to you in Kirkwall Cathedral and you I wasn't meant to talk to you and it all went quiet. And I told you I was from Barry and we had a good old chat. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to see if she remembers it. And she, if, she, if she could do me a little bit of a favor. So there you go. <laughs> OK, good luck. <laughs> thank you for that. You know, I'll, I'll pass your regards on, Gina. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you better and, remember uh, to ask her how her mother is. <laughs> <laughs> I am. So <laughs> how are you doing, Mum? <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway, okay. So if we do Margaret and Gina now, uh, what about what about uh, who are we going to do next? <laughs> Me yet? Oh, all right. Hang on a minute, we've done Margaret and Jean. I just no, need to know. No, we have done Margaret. Oh, I meant <laughs> Angie and Jean. Right? I'm losing the plot. Right, Margaret, go on then. <laughs> well, uh, classic Neanderthal skulls show that their brains were much bigger than ours. And uh, I'm just reading this old book again. Uh, and it said... Um, uh, that there would have been there would have been a low birth to adult brain size percentages. There would have been a lot of infant mortality because of the size of their their brains. Right. All right. Why oh, right. wouldn't your body adjust for that? Well, I guess they, they, would, they would have kind of morphed into us and our size brain, wouldn't they? Eventually. Yeah. yeah. If the high well, didn't. I eat. mean. Yeah. If they've all got big heads, the woman's going to be bigger to let the head out, surely. Well, it says it. Uh, no, almost no, of women, no. Almost of the women wouldn't have survived. <laughs> adults who retained low birth to adult brain size percentages, and it would have been a reduction in brow ridge magnitude, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on. But, um, yeah, they would have gradually shrunk, wouldn't they? Yeah. They... Uh, Changed into us. Exactly. Does that mean they got dense, got sort of less intelligent with smaller brains? Yeah, particularly people from Cornwall. <laughs> well, they said they may have had extra sensory perception. They might have used parts of their brain that <laughs> we We only use about a tenth of our brain capacity, so it would depend yeah. on how we use yeah. it. So. <laughs> that was really interesting that was that was thank you for that um right so we've done andy margaret and drina what about you Anne? no i found it very interesting and and quite varied i like the story about the old lady who went on till she was 90 <laughs> something i thought that was incredible um maybe because i'm nearly there but not doing anything <laughs> But uh, no, I found the, the whole thing very interesting. Really. Good, good. 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 Um, um, right, who, who else is next? Pete? Oh, uh, nothing for me. It was very really good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, what about you, um, Jessica? Gone. <laughs> You're gone. <laughs> Do not My God, I, I, I yeah. think some upset there. It must have been Pat. Right, Pat, anything you would like to say? 
No, no, <clears throat> I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay, my my absolute pleasure, and uh, thank thanks everybody for uh, um, sort of paying promptly this month, so we won't need to mention money again. Um, <laughs> And uh, obviously, we didn't have Claire and David tonight, so hopefully we'll we'll see them next week. So no excuses from Claire tonight, though she should have been here. Oh. So, uh, okay then. Well, anyone want to ask me anything else before we finish? Um, I remember reading a plaque at Kirby Lonsdale about the Romans in the Loon Valley, and they came across bears back then, apparently, yes. two thousand years ago. Wow. Yeah, we, we think bears didn't become extinct until about... There, there's lots of arguments with this, but um, there were probably the odd bear wandering around in Arnside up until about um, uh, the medieval period, and there were probably bears still hanging around somewhere in Britain until about the 1600s, probably. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the European brown bear, though, isn't it? Not the cave bear. Yeah. Ah. ah, right, yeah, the cave bear would have become extinct a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You, Andy's correct on that one. And he's very correct. Okay, then. Well, I'm going to, uh, if there's nothing else, thanks for everybody's contribution tonight. That was a blast. So we're doing the, uh, we're doing the wonderful um, Mastolithic period from 12,000 years ago to 8,500 years next week. So if there's nothing else to be said, well, I haven't got anything else. I'm going to, no, no. hopefully Sandra will be with Bye. us next week. So give her our love. So I'm going to say goodnight to Gina. Bye. Andy, Bye. Margaret, Hi, everybody. Pat and Jess and everybody else. Night, night folks. Take night. care. Night. Night. Bye. 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 It's my pleasure. Bye. Night, 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 night. Bye. It's always you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, night, night, you. Anyway, thanks for joining us tonight. And I'm a bit tired. And uh, I'll speak to you all soon. My God, I look like my mate David Marvelli. Oh, my God. Flipping heck, he looks a bit like this and he's bald, right? Yeah, I do look like a bit like him. He's a bit like my brother, you know. Um, anyway, I'll speak to you soon, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. I need to have a sit down, cup of tea. Right, here we go. I'm going to end that. Okay.